If you'd open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. Um, and while you open your Bible or copy the scriptures to Ephesians chapter 3, let me just say how uh, thankful I am to be here. This uh, institution and the people of this institution have shaped my life in every way. Uh, what uh, Dr. Aiken was referring to is that I was on an extended MDiv program, um, taking classes in the 2000s, the 2010s, and the 2020s, three decades it took to get the shortest version of the MDiv that Southern offers. Um, and so I stand before you today, this is the first time I've preached here as a graduate of Southern, and I'm very thankful uh, for that reality. But honestly, the highlight of my days these days is that I have three boys who are all enrolled at Boyce College. And it is the great joy of my life on Tuesdays and Thursdays when they're done classes to say, what'd you learn today? And just to hear the same truths that have guided my own life uh, all these years, uh, beginning to guide their lives through your imparting uh, them to them. So I am very thankful uh, to get to hopefully return some of the blessing uh, that you've given to me uh, as I open up God's Word this morning. I'm preaching on one of the most immediately desirable passages in the entire New Testament. It's a passage which just to read is to want and to feel a great need for. And so I want to read to you from this prayer of the Apostle Paul, one of his two great prayers uh, in this great letter of the Ephesians, and I, I think aside from the Lord's Prayer, certainly the most influential prayer in my life and ministry, and I hope it will be the same to you. The Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration and authority of the Holy Spirit, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, same power that raised Jesus from the dead. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Strengthened in your inner being. Christ dwelling in the heart through faith. Being rooted and grounded in love. Knowing how deep and how high and how wide is the love of Christ with a knowledge that surpasses knowledge. And then to be described as one who is filled with the fullness of God. It's basically impossible to be born again and not want that. So let's pray that God will make that a reality in our lives as he teaches us the prayer and we hope answers the prayer as well. Father, we come before you. You are the Father by whom every family on heaven and earth is named. And we want to ask you now that you would give us power to live, power to comprehend, and Lord God, that you would give us the fullness, the very fullness of God himself. And I pray that if any unbelief would distract our minds, we would remember that you are able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. Lord, we pray that you would do this in Jesus' name. <clears throat> 
I want to begin by just uh, letting you know what I'm going to say. I'm going to give you the reason Paul prays, the requests Paul gives, and the results Paul anticipates. And the reason I want to start with the reason Paul prays is because that's where the Apostle Paul starts. He starts there in verse 14 by saying, for this reason. There's a reason that's moving him to prayer. And a lot of ink has been spilled on exactly what this reason is. It can be something very broad, like his general concern for the Ephesians. But I'm inclined to think there is a specific reason why the Apostle Paul is praying this prayer at this time. And uh, the reason I think I know the reason is because I understand something which all preachers are inclined to, and that is the sanctified rabbit trail. All preachers who've ever been given a ministry by God have been a given, uh, an intent, they, they seem to incline towards drifting off onto various rabbit tails. I believe in the academic world they call these excursies, but it's all the same. It's just ways of going off track in a way that you hope will be helpful to others. And I believe the Apostle Paul under the authority and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has done just that from uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 to Ephesians 3 verse 14. Let me show that to you. Notice our text started with for this reason. And then in chapter 3 verse 1, we get a very similar and a very rare uh, phrase, for this reason again, and he says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and then we see something that most translations have adopted, this very long dash, and there must have been a committee room somewhere that decided that a very long dash was the way you indicated that the apostle was going off on a rabbit trail. Because you see, what Paul did is he just dropped on the Ephesians. Imagine your pastor says this to you, for this reason he's about to pray, I'm in jail for you. You're like, what? You're in jail for me? And the apostle Paul wisely thought after saying, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, he immediately realized, I better explain why I'm in jail. And so he literally spends 13 verses explaining why he's in jail and why it's for their good. But then... In verse 14, he gets back on track. Not something every preacher does, but the Apostle Paul did do here. Having said for this reason in chapter 3, verse 1, then explained why he had to go off on a little rabbit trail, he comes back and he says, for this reason I bow my knees. And if I'm right, then that would mean that we would look for the reason for why Paul is praying this way at the very end of chapter 2. And what we find there is that the people of God are being made into the temple of God. The people of God are being made into the temple of God. And the temple of God is where God himself dwells among his people. So you see that if you just pick things up in verse 20, describing the temple, the Apostle Paul says it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, its cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And then he says to the Jews and Gentiles, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, if you've ever panted for God, and if you're born again, you have, that is just the most exquisite thing you could ever hear, that God's own presence intends to dwell among His people, and we are His temple. But it might help all of us to just make sure that we have all that Paul would have had in mind when he said this. Because you see, when temples and tabernacles were built throughout the Old Testament, it was not, let's just say it was bigger than a Chick-fil-A opening, okay? It was, it, was, it, was, it was something of cataclysmic proportions. I want to read to you a few of the times in the Scripture where we have record of the tabernacle and then the temple being completed. In Exodus chapter 40, the people of Israel have settled in the, are, uh, they've, they've escaped slavery. They're heading towards the promised land. 
And they're building a movable tabernacle, a dwelling place for God. And when everything is set in order, we read in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the tabernacle was complete, God gave his exclamation point to the whole event by coming in such a demonstration of the power that Moses had to take a day off and just marvel because he couldn't enter. There was so much glory in their midst. The same thing happens when the tabernacle becomes a permanent home, when, when God transfers from canvas or from goatskins to brick and mortar. We see the same thing in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. The house of the Lord, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Again. Everyone's just finished building the te temple. That's exciting by itself. Everyone loves a new building project. But the most wonderful thing of all was that God himself came in such a demonstration of power that the priests couldn't minister. They had to just marvel at the presence of God. The third time a temple is filled is when the Lord Jesus comes to earth. And we read in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt, and many have offered the translation tabernacled. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I, just, I did a little study of what were the responses to Jesus during his earthly ministry. And here's some of the words that come up. Amazed, astounded, marveled at, worshipped, astonished, astounded. Every time God builds his temple, he blesses his temple with his own experienced presence. And what Paul is saying here is because of this, for this reason, because now God is not just doing this through a tent, he's not just doing this through a building, he's not only reserving it for his own dear son, but he's imparting this presence to his very people, and he's giving to his very people a, his own presence. For this reason, he prays. We often shortchange the heights of Christian experience that can be achieved in this life. We consider it the height of honesty to recognize how much sin can be present in a Christian's life, and there is wisdom to doing that because we don't want to create false expectations. But we often shortchange just how profoundly God can meet with His new covenant temple people. Having been moved to prayer, the Apostle Paul now makes two requests. The first is for power. The second is for love. Both are experiential. He makes the first request in chapter 3, and he says to this, he says in verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's where we need it, isn't it? That's where we need power. It's marvelous to see displays of God's power outside of us in miracles. I love that. I want to pray for more of that. The New Testament church regularly prayed for the manifestation of the Spirit. But where we need power to resist temptation is inside of us, in the inner man. And the early church was in the habit of praying for that kind of power, both in their extraordinary moments and in their daily grind. They prayed for it in their extraordinary moments, like after the first round of persecution when the New Testament church gathered with, the, I love this line, gathered with the friends and said, consider their threats and consider that your, and grant that your servants may speak with all boldness. What were they asking for? They were asking for, even though their outer man was being threatened, that their inner man would have a boldness from God. And they didn't just pray for this in extraordinary moments, they prayed for it 
in the daily grind. Colossians gives us a wonderful parallel passage and a passage that would certainly be precious to any of you who, like Dr. Aiken prayed, might be going through a time of trial. Paul prays that you'd be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. That really is the thing we need the most power for, isn't it? The daily grind. Anyone can mount up on wings like eagles. What's really hard is walking and not growing weary. And here the Apostle Paul prays that we would have power. Now notice that he prays that we would have power according to the riches of God's glory. God's glory is the effulgence of Himself, that's the display of His perfections. And notice it says where He's asking for power according to the riches of God's glory. Now, I love what David Jackman says about this passage. Notice that he doesn't say that you would have uh, power a, 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 from the riches of His glory. He doesn't say, he doesn't ask that you'd have power out of the riches of His glory, but that you would have power according to the riches of the glory. Imagine that you are uh, raising funds from a wealthy Christian donor for a particular cause uh, that you are uh, zealous about, and you ask someone who know, you know is a multimillionaire to give to this cause, and, and they say, you know what, I love that cause, that's a great cause, let me write you a check for 20 bucks. You would say, well, they didn't owe me anything. That's generous of them, that's what the Lord is leading them to do. But you would definitely leave saying, they gave to me out of the riches they have. On the other hand, if they were to say to you, here's a blank check, whatever you need. You just take whatever you need. I want to support the ministry you're involved in to the full, and there's no cost too great. You take whatever it requires to get things done. Then you would know you had been given according to the riches this person possessed. And here the Apostle Paul is praying that we would know power, not just out of God's riches, but according to God's riches. And the result, Paul tells us, of having this kind of power to obey, this kind of power to live, this kind of power in the inner man, the result of all this, says the Apostle Paul, is that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith. Well, that's a bit of a strange request, especially since we know that Christ already dwells in the heart of every believer. If you do not have the Spirit of Christ, then you're not His. So Paul is not praying that these Ephesian Christians would become Christians when he prays that Christ would dwell in their heart through faith. He's praying something very different. Uh, he, the word dwell here is actually could be translated settle. The idea here is that Christ would be able to settle down in their lives. And no one in my life at least has illustrated this better than D.A. Carson when he uses the illustration of a, a home. Maybe some of you have had the chance to remodel a home or you're living in an apartment right now and you're hoping that someday you'll remodel a home. And what happens during that process? Well, you get in there and maybe you got the thing at a deal, but there was some time period in life where people thought that olive carpet was a good idea in the bathroom and that, and that and all kinds of monstrosities are all over this home. But over time, you add a deck and repaint the walls, put a fireplace in the living room and find yourself saying, you know what? This place is really home. And when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, He comes into us right when we're converted, and we know from the New Testament that sometimes His followers take Him to be with prostitutes. We know from this room and the, ep the epidemic in our day that some of you take Him to look at pornography. He witnesses and is present for the most horrible outbursts of wrath and anger, jealousy, infighting between Christians, cold shoulders. But as His Holy Spirit works slowly and steadily on our souls, empowering us in the inner man, we become a place where Christ is comfortable being. And we begin to enjoy more of his presence. When was the last time you talked to a Christian and asked them about their Christian experience and they said, well, I, I know one thing. Christ has just settled down in my heart through faith. 
And with him like that, I'm rooted in love and I'm grounded in love. Rooted, the roots of my life are just drawing on his love. The foundation of my life is just set in his love. And all of that because he has become more and more comfortable in me because of the work the Holy Spirit is doing to empower me. The second request that the Apostle Paul makes is he makes the request that we would have an experience of God's love. He makes the request that we would have an experience of God's love. Notice what he says in verse 17. He finishes up the idea from his first request so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then he gives the second request that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Now, many attempts have been made to describe breadth and height and length and depth, and I've looked at my own and I've looked at theirs, and I've realized I'm not going to come close to them. The only thing uh, I can maybe say is this, such overwhelming language is being used to describe the fullness of what happened in Exodus 40 and 2 Chronicles 5. It's being used to describe just being overwhelmed with the love of Christ. Now, this is different, but not divorced from doctrinal knowledge. This is different, but not divorced from doctrinal knowledge. Any experience of the love of Christ that's not rooted and grounded in biblical doctrinal knowledge is dangerous. It will take you off. It will lead you astray. But we err greatly if we think that doctrinal knowledge is the high point of Christian experience. We were meant to melt under biblical doctrines. We were meant to read God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and it was to bring a tear to our eyes. We were meant to see that it's not that we loved God, but that God loved us and gave himself as a, gave his son as a propitiation for our sins and it was to make us flooded with the reality that his love is broad and deep and long and high and what we know and experience of this love doesn't, and this is not original to me, it doesn't doesn't bypass knowledge, but it does surpass knowledge. E.A. Carson again. Paul is not asking that his readers might be able to articulate the greatness of God's love in Christ Jesus or to grasp with the intellect alone how significant God's plan is in the redemption, plan of redemption. He is asking God that they might have the power to grasp dimensions of that love in their experience. Doubtless that includes intellectual reflection, but it cannot be reduced to that alone. A while back, a friend came up to me after church, brother trained at this institution, same body of knowledge that you are being imparted, sits under my preaching, so I think we're pretty like-minded. And he's going through an extreme trial with a business he's built up over many, many years. It's now being attacked through no doing of his own and undermined in every way. And if you can imagine having a life work undermined in every way, that's what this guy's going for, through. And so I'm asking about the details of this. And after we go over those for a while, I ask him, and how are, how are you doing? And he says to me, well, I was feeling quite burdened, quite weighed down. And then I sat down the other day to pray, and the love of God began to wash over my soul with such intensity that I just began to laugh and just realized if God loves me this much and is so sovereign, there's really nothing I have to fear. Ari Tori, the great Bible preacher, an evangelist of the last century, sought God 
for this kind of experiential knowledge and power with such intensity that at one point God began to pour out his love on Tori's heart with such power that Tori had to ask him to stop. I would love that if that was a problem in my church. Everyone's going, no, stop. Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan pastor of the 1700s, used to speak of an illustration where a son was walking along with the father. And he's happy walking with his father, holding hands. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Goodwin saw this father just grab up the son in his arms and embrace him and hug him and hold him. How much better is the rest of the walk after the father has just squeezed his son with his love? Notice with me the result Paul desired. The result Paul desired. He prays for power. He prays for love, both experiential. And then the final implication, the final result, the purpose of all this comes at the end of verse 19. That you may be filled with all the fullness of of God. What is the fullness of God? Well, it's prophesied for us in those pictures in the Old Testament, Shekinah glory, so overwhelming you just got to stop what you're doing dead in your tracks. It's fulfilled in the life of the Lord Jesus whose life makes people marvel and is astonished. The fullness of God is the fullness of the of the life and the character of Christ controlling us. It's what Schugel called the life of God in the soul of man. It's perhaps best and most easily described by the fact that Paul uses the fullness language at least four times in the book of Ephesians and most famously, do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, There's a particular fullness. It leads to wickedness. Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you trace that out, apparently leads to great marriages and good parenting and even happy servants at work, all wrestling and fighting the devil with great victory. I don't think you need me to describe Christian maturity for very long, maybe you let me do this. Do you notice that you do not get to maturity without experiences of God's love? What would you say if I told you part of my parenting style was I never hug my kids? You'd say, you're a moron. <laughs> it's amazing. You, you do a little research. You can Google this. Hugging decreases depression, releases dopamine, makes people happy, releases stress levels. What a burden it would be to be a child expected to grow to maturity without ever getting a hug from dad. And here's the apostle Paul who is acting like a father to our faith saying, I want you to have power and I want you to know the love of Christ so that it doesn't doesn't deviate from your doctrinal categories, but it fills them up beyond knowledge and full of feeling and joy and warmth. If you don't get that, You'll be what one preacher called, and there are many of these in our churches, many of these before me. You'll be an emotional atheist. Full of gospel math, God's holiness, my sin, Christ's redemption, my salvation. I can do it backwards, I can do it forwards, I can solve for X. But utterly devoid of that warmth 
that makes a person full with the very fullness of God. Worship leaders, when you prepare songs for us to sing, I trust if you're being trained in this institution, you are choosing songs that you know will be doctrinally faithful. Good, good start. Essential start. But don't forget what William Cooper sang about. Sometimes a light surprises the Christian when he sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. When comforts are declining, he grants the soul again a season of clear shining to cheer it after rain. Beloved, is that kind of thing optional or essential in our worship? Can you create mature disciples without people being pierced by affectionate love for God? Counselors. There's so much attention being given now to a person's past, to their past experiences, to the abuse they've suffered, to the trauma they've endured. And this is good. This is good and wise. We are ministering to people who've been raped, who've been in war, who've been made to feel crazy by the way they've been manipulated. And there's a wisdom to understanding how those past circumstances are affecting their present reality. Is part of your cure to pray for better present circumstances that they would know the love of Christ? What happens when the person who's been abused and maligned their whole life is flooded over and over because their counselor just keeps praying, oh, Lord God, would you please let them know how deep and how high and how wide is the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? There's a lot of talk about changing America right now. We picked a weird time to talk about it, right, when it seems all is lost. Let's all figure out how we can overtake the nation. And then we watch the uh, Twitter verse as we discuss these things and we walk away disgusted by the dumpster fire that is Christian Twitter. And we think, man, Twitter is really a bad problem. It's funny, we don't accept that logic with guns. We don't say that guns kill people. We usually argue that people kill people. And I would submit to you that even though the medium does shape the message, Twitter doesn't kill anybody. The reason people are so mean and cold on Twitter is because their hearts are mean and cold. The way you change that is you pray over and over and over that the people you're responsible for would be touched by the presence of God, by the love of God, by the power of God, so that they sound less like the conservative right in our day and more like Francis Schaeffer, who when he spoke prophetically to the culture he was in, spoke philosophically, passionately, biblically, and tearfully. Preachers. Our ministry is not merely a doctrinal impartation. When people hear us preach, they ought to be a demonstration of the spirit and of power. The apostle Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. That's what's moving him. C.H. Spurgeon said, my people come to watch me burn. What happens when a preacher that says, I will not stand in front of these people to speak until I've knelt before God like Paul to ask for God's power and to ask for God's love. Now I'm going to leave you with one encouragement and then I'm going to sit down. 
Last verse of our passage is very famous. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. It's a great passage. I've asked myself multiple times over the last number of weeks, why is it here? Why is it here? Hopefully someone in one of your classes is teaching you to ask that question. And I think it's here because the idea of being, now remember who these Ephesians were, thieves, they were guys who told dirty jokes, Ephesians 5, people had marriage troubles. They were a mess just like you and me before Christ started sorting us out. But I think for people like that to hear, you're the temple of God and you can be overwhelmed with power and glory and love is just a bit much to believe on your average Tuesday or Thursday or Saturday. And so I don't think it's an accident that after praying this prayer that just brings the whole weight of biblical theology, you are the temple of God. He's filling you after bringing it all onto their souls and saying, and I'm praying that you'd be built up in this power and that you would be overwhelmed with this love so that you are the very fullness of God. Like the Shekinah glory was the fullness of the old tabernacle. He says, I want you to know God can do it. He can really do it. No matter how messed up you are, how sinful you are, no matter what an emotional atheist you've been, no matter how prayerless you've been, no matter how perverted you've been, if you will pour, hand yourself over to God and ask him to do this work in you, he will and he can. Let's pray. Father, we pray and ask you that you would pour out your spirit on us, that we would know your power, and that we would know a knowledge that surpasses knowledge, that we would know how deep and how high and how wide is the love of Christ, and that we would take the lead like Paul in pursuing this for our people. And Lord God, that you would encourage us that you are exceedingly abundantly able to do more than we ask or imagine. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.